Hello, good evening. Uh, thank you very much for joining me. Um, I am going to be talking you through and more importantly, showing you uh, the work that we've carried out at Sackville over the last 14 months. So I'm gonna give you a quick introduction to Sackville first. Uh, Sackville House is located in East Grinstead, which is in West Sussex. East Grinstead was laid out as a borough in the early part of the 13th century and its wide high street used as a marketplace. It was flanked by 48 plots and each plot known as a burgage had a house on it with a piece of town, land or Portland running behind. And the main purpose of this was to provide food for the occupants. Now at just over 40 feet, Sackville House's plot is actually wider than the normal for the town, which is about 33 feet. And it's unusually long at 630 feet. Now, other than Sackville and its direct neighbour to the west, no other original plots actually remain in East Grinstead anymore. So the house was built around 1525 as a four bay continuous jetty house with the original wagon way giving access to the rear. The wagon way is, is still, still used as access today. It's believed that originally the kitchen was detached and this is depicted on the drawing on the right there for you. So Sackville House is a, what we call a legacy property. It was left to us by Ursula Webb upon her death in 1995. Ursula had been left the house herself by her father, the well-known stained glass artist, Geoffrey Webb. He actually used the attic space at Sackville as his studio. So when Lamarck got hold of the building, we appointed Peregrine Bryant as our architect. And apart from building a new staircase running up from the back hall, it was felt relatively little intervention was actually needed. We changed the position of the existing bathroom and added two more. The old flooring was replaced with handmade tiles. Outside, we painted the walls with lime wash and we rationalized the rainwater goods. So fast forward to the start of September 2019, and this happened. We got a call around, around 10 p.m. to say that a piece of the roof had fallen onto the pavement below narrowly missing a car. So we erected an emergency scaffolding over the pavement and onto a part of the road to ensure the safety of those below should it happen again. This elevation is on the main high street and there's a lot of foot traffic in cars. So COVID halted so many of Landmark's plans in 2020 and unfortunately Sackville was one of them. However, the Department of Culture, Media and Sport initiated a cultural recovery fund and Landmark was fortunate to be the recipient of a major grant um, from the fund, and it meant we could start the roof works at Sackville in January 2021. So what is Horsham Stone? <laughs> it's a very distinctive local material for Sussex and Surrey. Uh, Goddard's in Abinger is our only other building which has this roof covering. I am not exaggerating <laughs> when I say there is no new supply of Horsham stone slates, it does not exist. Large scale commercial extraction of Horsham stone was halted by the 1880s and regular quarrying ceased completely in the 1930s. Now a small quarry was reopened in 2004, but the thin slabs used for the roofing, it comes from the top of the quarry. So this has been completely exhausted. Of course, reclaimed stone does exist. However, it's extremely difficult to get hold of. And even if you can source it, it's often difficult to obtain its origin and whether it was sourced ethically or not. So SPAB, Society for the Protection of Ancient Buildings have declared there are no geological substitutes available. So an accepted re-roofing method is to also use local red clay tiles in with the Horsham stone. As you can imagine from what I've just said, this roof is extremely precious to us at Landmark. So the stone on Sackville roof when we started was laid out in what we call the double lap style, which is the bottom diagram on the right there. In essence, it means that instead of having just two stones overlap, it had three stones overlapping. Now, when we planned the project, we didn't actually know how many of the stones would be salvageable and reusable. It's not until all the stone is removed that a roofer could tell us how much we could actually reuse. Stones can break while being removed and if they've had any cement used on them at any point, then this means we won't be able to clean them up and reuse them. 
we were also aware that we had to ensure we evenly redistributed the weight onto this roof and that actually when we started the stone and tile layout the weight wasn't evenly redistributed so in order to stretch the stone over three out of the four roof slopes we decided to go to single lap style which is the diagram at the top there so this method has what we call shadow slates underneath and basically it means that instead of the three you go down to the two so when we started the project january last year horsham stone was the roof covering on the front of the north range half of the back of the north range and the whole of the south range west elevation a lot of directions there so i've highlighted it for you on the diagram on the left there now the dormers and other parts of the roof already had red clay tiles covering them you can just about see them on the dormers on the right hand side there so this sort of gave us an idea as to where we would and wouldn't be placing stone so i'm not going to go through <laughs> these drawings because there's a, there's a lot to take in um, and we'll be here until tomorrow evening, but it's just to give you an idea of the amount of work that was identified by myself and our architect once we got to site. So I just want to, to stress that this project was initially just supposed to be a re-roofing with really minimal timber repairs. But once we got to site with the scaffolding up and as we started peeling back the layers of construction, we realized that the amount of repair works that was actually needed was dramatically increased. Uh, in essence, we had to carry out work to almost every element of the building. I'm gonna go through many of the elements a bit later in the presentation with photos to sort of demonstrate the condition and the works that we had to do. So this is the front elevation facing onto the high street. This is where we lost that first piece of stone. I have just highlighted all of the elements. I mean, there's probably a lot more, but just to give you an idea as to all the bits and pieces that we had to do. So on the left here, we have the rear of that front range, and then we also have the very back of the right range on the right hand side there. And this is in the courtyard elevation. So for those that have visited, this is where you sort of park your car and we've got the front door there as well. So on top of our assessment of the building condition, we also had a timber decay survey carried out by Hutton and Rostrum, which although it was thorough, did not pick up even half of the rot that we actually found in the end in the frame. We then had our structural engineer, um, Justin McAteer, use these plans to start to, to give us an idea as to how we would deal with the structural issues. So all the green writing, all the little, the little diagrams there, those, that's, that's him <laughs> trying to work out what we needed to do. So the scaffold took three weeks to erect. And once it was up, we started with the roof. So we removed all of the stones, all of the tiles, we completely stripped it back to the timber rafters. Now these stones are big and the estimated weight of the roof, um, and this was given to me by our contractors who deal with Horsham stone quite a lot, it's about 300 tonnes. So it's a very, very heavy roof. Um, this is the South Range. So I've got a little diagrams up at the top right there, just so you can keep track of whereabouts it is on the building. Um, so this is it, completely stripped bare of tiles, stones, battens, everything. Now it felt quite eerie with the roof off, I have to say, considering the weight that this structure had been supporting, it really looked quite fragile when we stripped it back. Happily, the timber roof structure itself actually needed minimal repairs and it was in a much better condition than we originally expected it to be. So these are from the opposite end of that south range, looking back towards the north. And I'm hoping you can see my cursor here. So the, uh, the north range is just at the back of those photos there. And then we have the high street on the other side of it. So you can see some triangular pieces of timber there. We added these as reinforcements as there's no ridge structure on the roof here. And we were actually quite concerned about any movement that, that was gonna happen. So I mentioned earlier about only knowing work we needed to do once the layers of construction were peeled back. This is one of the first examples. So the top photo shows a broken purlin, which we obviously didn't know about because it was covered in reef. <laughs> uh, we had an inkling something was wrong as the bottom photo shows a quite a big warp that we actually found in the wall plate. 
Now we left the wall plate as it was, didn't really need anything doing to it, it wasn't broken, it was just warped. However, the broken purlin needed steel strapping on both sides as it was actually a, quite a big structural concern. Now, we believe that over time, the actual, the end of the south range has shifted and it's twisted in towards the courtyard due to a weakness in the frame. And we think this purlin was probably a part of that. So onto the front elevation, we had staining above the windows internally. Uh, again, when we took the roof covering off, we realized at some point metal stakes had actually been driven through the stone into the roof structure to hold a snow guard in place, which was allowing water to basically penetrate the structure completely. Um, we obviously removed the metal stakes. We had to remove a part of the internal plaster work and then we repaired some of the roof timbers which had rotted. But this was really the worst sort of rot that we found on the roof structure itself. So, as I said, minimal repairs really to the roof structure. Now these photos are actually out of sync with the program as the roof coverings didn't actually go back on until right at the end of the project as we had a lot of timber repairs to the frame that we had to carry out before we could reload the building with the roof. So this is a really great shot of photos just showing the progression and process of recovering the roof. We've got the red clay tiles here. So on the left we have green felt and then you can see those red battens going on. Now underneath this is sheep's wool. It covers the entire roof structure and we used it as an insulation material. We actually had no insulation here before at all. So we're really hoping this will greatly improve the energy performance of the building. Now, there was a choice between sheep's wool and a man-made breathable insulation, which would have been just as good. However, we were unable to get hold of the man-made insulation as it comes from Holland. And this was not only during Brexit, but COVID and the time scales to get it to site was really just unknown and we couldn't wait. So this is just one of the complications that we experienced, which were caused by the current global pandemic. We had a lot of material shortages. So the middle photo, we have tiles going back onto the roof. This is now the only major roof slope which has red clay tiles and not Horsham stone. These are red clay Kima tiles. And on the right, we have the finished result. The tiles are still the same red color. They will start to darken. I think I just took this photo on quite a bright day. So they look like they're a different color. So onto the Horsham stone. This is a very different process to laying really any other roofing material that I've come across. The stones have to be sorted as they're removed from the roof into sizes. So the height is the most important part and all the stones at the same height are grouped together. Putting a Horsham stone roof back on is like putting together a giant puzzle without having the finished photo. Uh, you can see from the photo on the left that each stone is a completely different shape. So the courses have to be laid out one by one. We had no idea if we were going to have enough stone until we got really to the last few courses on the last roof slope. So the photo on the left shows how the first course goes on and the kind of shapes we had to deal with as well with the stone. And um, those stones there are about 80 centimetres in height and they're some of the biggest that we had on site. The photo in the middle that we have there shows the first three courses which are on the back of the north range and you can actually see those shadow slates that I mentioned peeking out the top of the stone just those darker grey slates there and on the right we have the stone going onto the last slope on the south range. So great comparison photo here for so many reasons. First off the new roof on the right hand side looks great Blue skies definitely help there. Um, you can see quite a few elements. So you can see the new red ridge tiles, which we used. Ridge tiles made of Horsham stone don't exist. So they have to be red clay tiles. Uh, you can also see new oak frames for the windows and also our new rainwater gutters. But if you look at the Horsham stone specifically, um, you can see the stones look larger on the right hand side. And that's because we've gone from the double lap on the left to that single lap on the right side there. So let's move on to roof lights. <laughs> we had two to replace here, um, simply because they were both leaking. So these were, were put in by, by the previous owner. The smaller roof light, pictures on the left, uh, in situ, nice and straightforward. It was a standard size, and the one that we removed was a metal roof light. Now the second roof light, 
was more complicated and is shown on the right there in two parts, which gives you an idea as to a part of the complication. It is huge. <laughs> um, when we got up to actually have a look at it, it was just panes of glass being held on by a makeshift softwood frame. It leaked and actually a pane had shifted completely just before we started on site. So we had a bespoke one made. Why bespoke? I hear none of you ask. <laughs> um, because when we started to measure it, it's not straight, it's not equal, there's no right angles, and therefore it's not a standard size. I'm not exaggerating when I say this was an incredibly frustrating element. And it was also puzzling us as to how to get the new window into place. You can see the size of it there and the idea of trying to crane a fully constructed window into place gave me many sleepless nights. We would have had to have closed down the high street. It would have been very, very stressful. So overall, it took 10 weeks to design this window, 12 weeks to make, and it took us two days to get it up onto the scaffold and into place. <laughs> um, but it's in, it's beautiful. And for those who get to visit, it really makes the attic space amazing, especially on a lovely sunny day. So Sackville has eight dormers. We have four on that front range. We have two in the corners where the north and the south wing attach. And then we have a further two on the south wing looking into the courtyard. The ones on the front were so fragile and flimsy that we actually expected a couple to collapse once the roof covering was removed. There was almost no structural frame to speak of and actually the window frames themselves were the only real structure. As you can see from that photo on the left there, they were all really quite rotten. So we had to rebuild them, we had to brace the side panels, we had to rebuild the roof structure and then we insulated and felted. So something that was missing from all the dormers, not just the front dormers, was proper waterproofing and the method of keeping water from causing the kind of damage that we were having to repair. As a part of the works, we have incorporated a lot more lead into the dormers and actually the building as a whole. So here on the left, you can see us starting to plan the secret gutters around the dormers, which would aid in channeling the water from the roof down into the front gutter and not just into the dormers. On the right, is said secret gutter in place waiting for the dormer roof covering to go on. So finished example with front dormers. The cheeks and the red, sorry, the, the cheeks and the roof um, are in those red chemo tiles that we had on, on the back. Um, we've received questions already about the width of the dormers on the front as they are now wider. Um, quite simply, they're now insulated and they have a solid construction compared to the previous dormers. <laughs> they have new lead aprons at the front that you can see on the photo on the right hand side there. This waterproofs the join where the dormers meet the roof and we also have those new cover boards on either side again just to stop any possible water ingress here. So once the works began on the roof the wall on the cross passage began to move. Um, it started to separate from the floor and from the roof. And we actually had daylight on the inside of the building at the top and bottom of this wall. So we propped from underneath and we took some of the lath and plaster ceiling in the cross passage off. What we discovered was that the floor of this bedroom above the cross passage was not being supported on this beam at all. It was effectively floating. <laughs> The beam had almost completely rotted at either end and we knew it probably needed some work whether it was replacing or not. Effectively this part of the building structurally had no support and was actually causing our structural engineer to scratch his head and he told us at the moment he had no idea how the floor had not collapsed which was not very reassuring. <laughs> now that was until we took the panels off and this is what we found. Yes, those are large 20th century concrete blocks forming the first floor wall. Our structural engineer actually believes that this is the whole reason why this part of the building was being held up. They were compressed and had formed basically a bridging structure over the cross passage. So we had this beam and the cross braces tested by a timber decay specialist. Following the results, it was decided that the timber here needed to replace. So we didn't remove the concrete blocks, we left them in situ, we packed between the floor structure and this new beam to ensure they were resting and we repaired the infill panels. 
this is actually now one of my favorite parts of the building because it looks as if we haven't touched it but really there's so much work going on here and I think it looks quite beautiful so both of these photos are after photos so those are the new pieces of timber there this is one continuous piece of kiln dried oak it's huge it's about five meters long and we had no idea when we started on site that we needed this so we hadn't ordered it This is one of our mysteries of the project. It's revealed when we took the roof off uh, by the large South Range chimney. There are two holes that have been punched into the chimney and we have no idea why and we still don't, unfortunately, which is slightly frustrating. Um, structurally, this was also another concerning area. There's nothing tying this side of the building to the chimney or really stopping the end part of the South Range from continuing to twist inwards. So we had a new large section of oak uh, put in place as the wall plate had basically disintegrated. And you can see a metal strap there as well, which we use to hold the wall in place. As I mentioned before, the timber frame was really not a part of the original project at all. But once we got on site, it just became so obvious that we couldn't leave it in the condition it was with all the inappropriate interventions that had been made using cementous mortar. These photos are a very, very small collection of these mortar repairs. Now, the reason we couldn't leave them in place is that the cement dries completely solid. So as the building continues to move, which naturally it will do as a historic building, the joins open back up again and the mortar traps the water behind and it causes more rot to the timber frame. So to repair these smaller parts of the frame, which were mostly around joints, we used a mix of two different methods. Where the joints were large uh, enough, we used oak. Where the joints were smaller or where there were cracks that would have been big enough to trap water, we used something called kiln burnt pine tar. <laughs> now it's similar to resin or mastic, but it's completely natural. And although it dries, it never completely hardens. So it retains that flexibility, which is of course great for our historic buildings. Now, these photos here are just a few of the huge amount of timber repairs our team carried out. Uh, we had a three-man team of carpenters for most of the project, and actually the head carpenter was also our site foreman. Uh, on the entire building, there was not an elevation that did not require timber repairs. Now, the diamond pieces of timber you can see at the top left corner, they're actually cover pieces, as this piece of timber is structural, so we bolted it in, and the, the pieces are then covering the bolts. This is one of my favorite repairs. <laughs> it's on the south range in the courtyard. The wall plate you can see there was replaced as it had rotted through, but due to the movement of the building, we then had to add this piece on top to make sure the timbers above had the support. I just think it's really beautifully chamfered. So moving on to some repairs with some good before and after photos. <laughs> on the left hand side here, we have the front elevation oriel window. It's completely rotted down the right hand side and internally because we had a corroded gutter above so water was just pouring down it. We managed to save the end piece there, but we did have to remove and replace other parts of the timber frame, including a part of the wall plate underneath which you can just see there in that bottom photo. Um, the middle two photos, this is another wall plate which had to be replaced. It's on the very south end of the building just above the kitchen very exposed to weather. And we also had a large yew growing here, which was right up against the building. So it's holding all the moisture right up against the building there. This has now been cut back and as you can see it's been replaced. Last two photos on the right there. Those that have visited may or may not have noticed this is a chronic leak that the building has had. On the right hand corner of this dormer window, water would just run all the way down and there was almost this permanent water run stain no matter how many times it was redecorated so this is a dormer that we rebuilt we've actually covered it in lead um, we rebuilt a part of the window frame and also a part of the timber frame internally and it was also replastered so the bottom right hand photo in the corner there that's that's it finished <laughs> another before and after here this is the secondary door into Sackville, which was actually in a very sorry state when we took the cover pieces off, which you can see there on the left. The frame was rotten and the mortar had actually fallen out as well. We also repainted the two front doors in landmark red, which I think looks, uh, looks really smart, looks really nice. 
although about 75 to 80 percent of the work we carried out was external internally we could not avoid some work due to the vibrations caused by the roof we already had some areas internally which had cracking in the plaster work before we started so we knew we'd lose some areas of plaster with banging and just general movement of the building we just weren't quite sure how much we were going to lose so the three photos on the left there, this is one of the bedrooms. And you can see some more of those concrete blocks making up the internal wall. This actually presented a complication as we had to use a special mix of lime mortar to make sure it would adhere to the concrete surface. And on the right is the bathroom next door to this, which again has, has lost a whole load of plaster. We actually had to carry out quite major replastering in the end to four rooms, including the attic. And then the interior has been completely redecorated. So here we are, it's finished. <laughs> now there are some things I haven't shown you photos of, but I'm gonna run you through them while you look at this very lovely photo of the front elevation, which hasn't actually been seen since September, 2019, when we first put that scaffolding up. So we have all new gutters on the building, you can see on the front there, the, uh, the gutter running along. We removed all the existing gutters as they had either corroded, they weren't big enough, or we actually found some plastic gutters as well. Now the gutters that were already there have been replaced with bigger gutters, bigger capacity, and our architect actually designed a completely new rainwater system. Water, as you may or may not have realized, was a very big problem for this building. So we had to think a lot about the new system to ensure it was taking as much water as possible away from the building. We had to rebuild a part of the sitting room floor as the timber joists had decayed in the basement. We then took up and relayed the sitting room floor, carrying out repairs where the decay had spread to the floorboards. We have fitted new extraction systems in all the bathrooms and also in the kitchen. We have replaced about 30 infill panels. We found a mix here. Uh, we didn't replace any original ones and actually most of them were modern gypsum panels which didn't flex and therefore cracked and shrunk away from the frame as the building moved. As we carried out repairs to the frame, the panels either cracked or they fell out entirely. Now, including all the dormers where the frames had rotted and had to be replaced, we rebuilt 11 of the windows completely and all the windows have been redecorated. We repointed and re-leaded all four of the chimneys and actually we re, re oh, sorry and actually we partially rebuilt the two on the south range we also have lovely new chimney pots we have decorated inside and out including those lovely red doors <laughs> we've upgraded the electrics here we have two new fuse boards and we're also installing an electrical vehicle charging point it's just they're very popular at the moment so ours hasn't actually arrived yet <laughs> Now we had to carry out quite extensive repairs to the front wagon way gate, as unfortunately we suffered a break in and a theft. We lost about two and a half thousand pounds worth of cut lead. Um, this was quite a big blow for us midway through the project. Not so much financially, but time and program wise as we had to source more lead and it all had to be recast again. Unbelievably, the lead that was stolen was due to be fitted to the building the next day. Luckily, it wasn't ripped off of the building, as obviously that would have caused a lot of damage, but it was still a bit demoralizing for everyone, unfortunately. Um, as we started in 2021, we didn't have any COVID restrictions halting work. And because of the caution the team on site took and the strict COVID rules we put in place regarding face coverings, hand sanitizing, and working in isolated teams, we didn't actually have a single COVID outbreak on site, considering sometimes we had 25 people working in quite a narrow and compact scaffold. It's really a credit to our team that we had there. Now, I mentioned earlier about material shortages we had. So our contractors had difficulty sourcing copper nails for the Horsham stone, battens for the roof, lime, timber was a, a huge problem we had as well. And we had to order the red clay chemo tiles before we'd even remove the roof, as we were being told they had a 15 month order backlog due to COVID shutdowns in 2020. So just a couple of points to make about the approach that we decided to take. Our architect and I were, and still are, of the opinion that truthful, honest repairs was really important. 
not only to ensure that for future generations, they can look at Sackville and see the repair we've made openly instead of them being concealed, but also for those who visit and get to enjoy our buildings. So we decided not to try and stain or discolor the timber repairs. They'll age gracefully over time. <laughs> but for those visiting now, you can also see very clearly the work that we've carried out. We've also left what we call tide marks on the Horsham stone. You can see it really clearly in this photo here. <laughs> um, there are methods to use. You can use things like yogurt to encourage natural growth, so moss to darken the stone. And I believe at one point we had a bucket on site, which no one would go near, which was full of milk, yogurt, which had been there a while. <laughs> but in the end, like the timber, we decided to leave it as it was. So this is my last slide. <laughs> we started work January 2nd, 2021 and we achieved practical completion on the 10th of February, 2022. We had our first bookings go into Sackville on the 18th of March this year, and Sackville was closed for 442 days to carry out this work. Cost-wise to date, we've spent around 770,000 pounds on construction. This includes a very large scaffold that we had. We spent just over 88,000 on consultants, our fantastic conservation architect, Nicola Westbury, our structural engineer, Justin. We had timber decay specialists, and we also had a party wall surveyor as well. Now, for those who are interested, Sackville has its first open days since the works on the 10th and the 11th of September. And thank you everyone for hopefully staying with me and listening. Um, and that is the end, that's all I have. <laughs> Thank you so much, Olivia. That was completely fascinating. <laughs> and um, thank you also for agreeing to take some questions. So yes. I'll read some out for you. Um, what was the thickness of the wall insulation? Did it have an impact on the overall thickness of the roof and therefore the height of the ridge, relationship with the eaves, etc.? We did have to, um, we did have to, the, the roof is, is slightly higher. It, it wasn't a huge impact because it's, uh, because it's wool insulation, it compacts down. I think actually if we'd probably gone for the wood fibre, it's a lot less flexible and actually it would have caused probably the roof to go even higher. But with the wool insulation, we managed to get it in between the rafters. So although we raised ever so slightly, it's definitely not noticeable and it didn't make sort of a big impact on the structure at all, thankfully. Thank you. Um, many thanks, well done to all. When you're almost designing a whole new roofing cover, covering process, I guess this must be out with normal building regulations. Is this a problem or can it be signed off by someone under their special rules for old buildings? So we actually had, we applied for two listed building consents in the end. Um, we had the first listed building consent approved when we just thought we were going to just be doing the roof structure. And when we realized we had a whole load more work, uh, work to do, we went in and applied for another listed building consent, but we did actually go through building regs for this. So we had uh, one of their officers, I think he attended site maybe six or seven times um, and just sort of had a list that he ticked off. So we actually had, we had a really, really good team from the local authority. We had no issues with the conservation officer with planning or with the, the building regs officer. They were really helpful and they understood what we were doing. Thank you. Um, next one is oldest trick in the book. Take before photographs on a dull day and afters on a sunny day. <laughs> Absolutely. <laughs> but it looks so good, doesn't it? I mean, I, I have after photos and it was actually a dull day. And then we had um, we had our photographer, John Miller, take the new ones and it just looks fantastic, doesn't it? And it really does look this good, I promise. <laughs> um, you mentioned the SPAB's approval of using clay tiles. Mm -hmm. What other aspects of heritage philosophy did you face? So we actually had, um, we had SPAB visit us at one point actually, um, because they were in uh, East Grinstead at the time with, um, with a couple of, of the people there. And they were actually really impressed with what we were doing, but I think um, 
because of the time that we had to do this and um, because of the I want to say budget but I mean I, I, I was obviously told you know I can't keep spending money um, but there were there were certain things that we had to do we actually a lot of the panels that have gone back on are not lath um, so we actually went on with wood fiber panels so a lot of them especially the photo that's currently on the screen um, where it's over the cross passage there and where the where we replace those panels those are actually wood fiber and it's then got lime mortar over the top so there probably are a couple of things that if if we had you know someone come and tell us exactly what we should and shouldn't have done there are probably some things that they would question but we had as i said the, the budget that we had the time that we had the fact that We've used materials that are completely acceptable, but we maybe haven't gone completely back to exactly how it should have been. Thank you. Um, it's a slightly controversial question here, uh -oh. <laughs> tricky one. But, um, if the problems hadn't been discovered, how long do you think it would have been before a serious collapse occurred? I think we were quite lucky here because Sackville is a terraced building. Um, so we were essentially being propped up on both sides by our neighbours. Um, I do think, and it, you know, something that we, we did discuss briefly with the structural engineer and, oh, sorry, my face is gone. Um, with the structural engineer and with our architect um, about what would have happened if this was a detached property, a little bit like Goddard's. Um, I don't know. We, we, we certainly had some areas structurally that were really concerning. And I think when we actually got to them and realized quite how bad they were, I think it shocked, um, certainly shocked us. Um, it, you know, it sort of shocked others in Landmark. Um, Thankfully, we didn't get to that point. We caught it when, when we did, and it's now beautifully repaired. <laughs> Thank you. Um, about the new bath, the bathroom ventilation, mm -hmm. I can't see any ducts coming through the roof. So where do they go? Ah, so you can see a duct. So if you look at this photo here, um, the, the small roof light, there's a very, very small gray triangle just above that roof light. So they actually come out through the roofs. So we have one there and we also have one, you can't see in this photo, but on the um, roof structure that's sort of coming towards us, it's just on the other side. So they're very nicely concealed in lead. And luckily, because we obviously have a, a, a gray roof, they maybe don't stick out as much as they could have done. <laughs> um, were the works delayed by having to wait for the right bat season? No, we actually, which surprises my colleagues, actually, we had no problems with bats. We had no ecology questions. We had absolutely nothing about bats. So the works were purely delayed because COVID threw everything off. And of course, our contractors, you know, they were, they were set to start works at a certain time. They had other projects planned. So we then almost had to fit in with what they were doing as well. So no bats, thankfully. <laughs> Um, what an amazing story. How much did it all cost? <laughs> so, um, yeah, said briefly, we are, so we've obviously got a, a 12 month sa uh, snagging period, which started in February. Um, but we are currently, <laughs> we're, we're over the 800 K mark. So 770,000 for the construction costs and about 88,000 for, for all our consultants. Um, we did have it partially funded, as I said, by um, the uh, Heritage Cultural Recovery Fund. So they funded about 210,000 pounds of that. So we didn't pay for all of it, but it, it was a, a significant chunk of money which we had to spend. Um, does Landmark use ordinary rock wool as insulation ever? Um, not that I've come across, no, certainly not that, that I've used, but this is, I've only been at Landmark since August 2020, so this is my first major project, um, and wool insulation was, was something that we wanted to use here because it's so natural, 
um, and it means that the building will breathe and again you know that that's a, a really big thing for, for all of us that work in historic building conservation is the breathability of the building and the breathability of everything that we put in so really insulation was just what was recommended here by, by our architect. Um, a major headache for the Landmark Trust and all the team sounds as though you all face the challenge and have come out relatively unscathed well done Olivia and all the team thank you all. <laughs> <laughs> thank you very much yes I'm safe. I mean I, I'm still here so you know. um but this was as I said I, I started um August um sort of spent however many months trying to to work out you know sort of how many buildings I had and, and what was wrong and you know what works we needed to do what maintenance we needed to do and then suddenly January I started on this so it's it's almost it's almost been the only thing that I've done. I've obviously done other things for Lamb Up, but it's been quite um, quite absorbing and, and sort of all in consuming. Um, but it's been it's been a massive learning curve. You know, it's fantastic. It's it's really quite rare um, that you get to do a project like this. And certainly with a landmark that's already up and running, um, we obviously have, you know, when we, we bring new landmarks on board, um, there's certainly a huge amount of work that has to be done there. But but actually with a landmark that's already up and going and um, to be able to do something quite this big and quite this major was looking back on it it was fantastic in the moment I think there were probably times where I wanted to pull my hair out um nothing seemed to go smoothly as I said we had thefts we had Covid we had Brexit and um, we had some difficulties with the neighbours you know we had a huge scaffold up for for almost a year um which of course nobody wanted nobody liked um, it was incredibly frustrating for us as well that we couldn't finish when we wanted to. Uh, originally, this was supposed to last three months, you know, and we ended up being closed for 442 days. So, yes, I, I love it now. You know, I, I'm not planning on going back to Sackville for probably a while. I think we need to have a bit of a break from each other. Um, but it's it's gorgeous and it was completely worth it. OK. Um... What a beautiful restoration. I assume the roof lights are not original. Interested in why they, they were replaced rather than removed. Um, so, oh, sorry. <laughs> no, that's <laughs> um, So, no, not original. Um, they were both, we believe, put in by uh, Jeffrey Webb, um, especially the larger one on the right hand side that you can see in the photo there. As I said, that was his studio. Um, so it lets in an incredible amount of light there. The conversation was actually had um, between myself, between um, Caroline, our historian, and actually Anna visited site as well, because especially the roof light on the right hand side, it, it did start to pose quite a few issues, you know, 10 weeks to design something. Um, and we were obviously on a, a time frame, you know, we, we did have to get on with other things. And, the conversation was had about whether actually we just decide to block the roof light back up entirely and you know sort of try internally to depict where it would have once been but I think we decided that historically it was a part of the building you know it was a part of the development of the building it was a part of the previous owner's use and um, so we decided to keep it um, and as I said, if you, you get to visit on a really sunny day, it just completely changes the attic space. It's really quite gorgeous with that in there. Thank you. Um, can you explain the shadow slates a bit more? Yes. Um, do you want me to go back onto the, um, the slide that I had, do you think? Uh, if you don't mind. No, that's absolutely fine. Um, Sorry, we're gonna we're gonna whiz back through here. Um, gosh, I talked for a while, didn't I? Right, here we go. <laughs> okay, so um, so the shadow slates are um shown in that top. Oh, sorry, my hand's in front of the the camera there. Um, they're shown in that top diagram as um those sort of blue squares. It's basically to to help fix the Horsham stone onto the building. As I said, these stones are really heavy. It's not like having slates on or tiles where you know you can just pop a couple of nails in and they'll stay up. 
these are weighty pieces of, of material. So the shadow slates are fixed onto the battens first and then they are mortared and then the stones are then actually basically stuck on top of them. So it's just to give extra stability. It's to stop the idea of any stones falling down, sliding out of place. Um, yeah, so I, I, I've never come across it before. It was really fascinating watching our, um, our contractors do it. Um, and it's something that they do, they do with quite a lot of Horsham stone. They actually did um, the repairs to the barn at Goddard's that was done a couple of years ago now. That was also Horsham stone. Um, so they are very, very well equipped to, to do this. Um, yeah, really, really quite fascinating actually. Hopefully that answered the question. Thank you. Um, thanks so much. What a can of worms the slip tiles turned out to be. Yeah. You mentioned that some Horsham stone can be unethically sourced. Do you mean stolen? And the other bit of the question is, did the police catch the lead pinchers? Oh, I know. Um, yes, um, to the first part of the question, they can be stripped off of, um, off of roofs and also nine times out of 10 where you have Horsham stone, the building's listed. Um, and as we know, people don't always get a stood building consent to do the works. Um, so it, it literally can be stolen. Um, during the works, uh, our contractor actually told us that there was an unlisted building um, somewhere in the area uh, that they were working on. And the owner actually wanted to take all of the Horsham stone on. They didn't want Horsham stone roof anymore. They just wanted slate. And he actually wouldn't tell me where this building was. It is that rare, it's that guarded. Um, Yes, it's, it's, it's really bizarre. Um, unfortunately, no, nobody caught our lead thieves. Um, we did have, there was CCTV, I think on the other side of the road. Bear in mind, this is a really busy high street. You know, we've actually got, on the left-hand side, we have, um, we have a shop and we have residential. And on the right-hand side, we also have residential. And, you know, we've got, we've got shops opposite, we've got flats, really, really brazen. Um, I have to say for someone to break in, it's not like, you know, we're sort of a, an out of the way building. We have, you know, loads of landmarks that are completely isolated. And um, so we were all really quite shocked by this. And unfortunately, CCTV, although we got it off of the shop opposite and um, nothing came of it. So sadly, no one's been caught. Thank you. Um, how do people book a place on the open days? I think that might actually be a better question for me to answer. <laughs> okay, I might have to pass that to you. <laughs> yes, that's fine. Um, if you'd like to go to one of the open days, then um, if you go to the website and then look under events, it has all our open days listed and you can book them online. Um, at the end of this, I'm going to send out a... Um, in, in a couple of weeks, I'm going to send out a link to a recording of this talk, and I'll actually put a link on that as well to show you um, where you can book um, the open days. Um, it looks as though the building to the left has Horsham stone on the lower part, but clay tiles at its top. Fast forward. Sorry, everyone, for flashing a whole load of photos in front. Yes, yes. So this is um, this is another way that um, it's another accepted method of doing it. So they've actually kept the um, double lap on the left hand side there, and they've then any tile, any stone um, that they couldn't reuse. They've basically taken off of the top. Again, it's something that, um, that we did uh, at Goddard's. So the barn at Goddard's is, is sort of similar now. It's, it's sort of three quarters Horsham stone and then it's red tile at the top. I think it looks slightly peculiar. Um, so I'm really glad that we actually managed to stretch Horsham stone over all of the roofs, but it's, it's another method. Thank you. Um... Did you offer to repaint your neighbor's barge boards and do bits of their maintenance from the scaffold, having got the access up there and having <laughs> inconvenienced them for so long? <laughs> Is this my neighbor talking? I don't know. 
um, yes, there are there are a couple of bits and pieces that we had to do. The property on the left in the photo there, um, happily, you know, we, we didn't impact the building in any way there. The building on the right, there's a couple of bits and pieces that the work unfortunately affected. We had a couple of slip tiles. Um, we have a barge board to repaint there. Um, and just a couple of other bits and pieces, you know, they're, they're our neighbour. Um, they dealt with us, you know, us having this huge scaffolding, as I said, up for a lot longer than any of us thought. Um, one thing about the project is that, I mean, as, I, as I've said, we, we kept, you know, finding new things each time we took, you know, a piece of timber off or, or we took a, an infill panel off. I mean, somebody said a whole can of worms opened up. So we did have to keep extending it. Um, and as you can imagine, you know, it's terrace property, we're right next to our neighbors, re-roofing a building. None of the work that we did was particularly quiet. Um, so to be neighborly, there are a couple of bits and pieces for the property on the right that we, we are doing definitely, yeah. Thanks. Um, you mentioned that this is the first project you did um, since you joined Landmark. What were you doing before that? So before Landmark, I actually worked at Windsor Castle. I worked for the Royal Household in their building department. Um, so dealt with day-to-day -day maintenance at Windsor, um, at the properties that they have in the Great Park there, and also a couple of properties that they have over near Hampton Court as well. So historic buildings are absolutely my <laughs> cup of tea um, and yeah I went from having a, a, a prestigious I guess you'd say portfolio of buildings to having a portfolio of buildings that are just some of the most gorgeous peculiar <laughs> but lovely buildings and um, I think I prefer well I do prefer working for Landmark obviously um, <laughs> but <laughs> I, I actually do prefer having the range of buildings that we have you know I mean, it's something that obviously everybody knows about landmark no two buildings are the same um, and i find that um a lot more interesting certainly challenging because every building is different how we repair buildings how we maintain them is obviously different in every single way um but you know it i think it's far more interesting thank you and then just to finish off um Copper nails will eventually corrode. Why didn't you use stainless steel nails? So I have to say this isn't something that I particularly um, asked our contractors. I might actually ask them um, and possibly pass the information on to Teresa and she can uh, maybe, maybe send it on to you. But I trusted our roofing contractors and this is the way that it's done. This is the type of material that they use in order to to, to re-roof Horsham stone roofs. Um, it probably would have been easier because, you know, we had a, we had a huge problem getting hold of the copper nails at one point. Um, but this is just the accepted material and it's the accepted type of, of nail that they use. As I said, they, they do a lot of Horsham stone roofs. Um, so yes, maybe I'll, I'll, I'll actually ask them and, and possibly send the information on just so that you can find out yourself as well. <laughs> Um, thank you so much for um, doing the presentation and then answering all the questions. That's okay. Um, I really appreciate it. Um, I'm afraid that's all we've got time for. So, as I said, I will be sending you a link to this um, webinar at the um, in the next couple of weeks. And what I'll also do is I'll um, put a link to an invitation we sent to several other friends events, which went out at the end of March. Um, in case you've missed it. Um, and so if you wanted to, you could sign up for um, some other events. There are still some spaces left. Um, the first thing coming up is an actual physical visit to the Grange um, in Ramsgate, Kent, on Friday the 10th of June from 10 till 12. The Grange was built by Augustus Pugin to be his family home. Um, and we'll have um, Alistair Dick Cleland, who a lot of you know, will be there um, to explain the building to you. Um, and then um, we also, the next webinar that's coming up is um, how to bag a landmark, 
the potentials process. Uh, this is on Thursday, the 21st of July at 6.30. Alistair Dick Cleland will discuss in an online talk, the fascinating question of how we choose new buildings to be landmarks, including how future landmarks are found, assessed and evaluated. This is something that um, we're asked about a lot. And so, um, and I think we've got lots of staff signing up for that one. <laughs> I was well gonna say Brian. that sounds really interesting. <laughs> <laughs> I also have to recommend visiting the Grange as well. I did briefly get to look after it. Um, and it's a fantastic landmark. It's entirely different, I have to say, um, especially internally to a lot of landmarks that we have. And it's it's really quite astonishing. So I definitely go. <laughs> Thank you very much. And thanks to everybody for um, joining us today. I hope you've enjoyed it. Um, yeah, I hope we'll see you all soon. <laughs>